Hello, my name is Ella Karev. I'm a PhD candidate in Egyptology at the University of Chicago, and today I will be talking about the Iliad in Ancient Egypt. Today's lecture will revolve around a particular piece from the Oriental Institute collection, a fragment of Homer's Iliad. I'll be speaking about the fragment itself, and how a papyrologist can determine that a fragment is indeed the Iliad, and then go about completing it by comparing it to our version, our known version of the Iliad, which naturally leads us to speak about where our version came from. Since the Iliad was also part of the canonical text learned by scribes in the process of learning their craft, we'll talk a little bit about that and then the Iliad as literature, including its role in the famous Library of Alexandria. Lastly, I'll speak a little bit about the role of epic poetry in general from the Egyptian perspective. Our starting point for this lecture is, as I said, this really truly lovely little bit of papyrus from uh, the Oriental Institute. Its official name is OIM E2058. OIM for Oriental Institute Museum and E for Egypt. It's not large, roughly the size of a postcard, and exhibits a really nice, clear handwriting with rounded letters that is pretty typical for literary texts. There are a few corrections in the text, which we'll be looking at in detail in just a little bit. But the first question arises, how does one even go about figuring out that this is the Iliad? When a papyrologist is confronted with such a text, our very first hope is actually that the literary fragment is the Iliad, if only because it makes it that much easier to identify. But, you know, first we have to read it. Here you can see the first two lines of the papyrus, which have reproduced with proper word spacing and diacritics like accents and breathing marks. But if you know your Greek, or if you know your Iliad, or if you know both, it's evident pretty quickly upon comparison with our canonical Iliad that some letters and even some portions of lines are just missing. Knowing this, we can now restore the remaining letters to construct these lines, and then pretty much repeat the process for what's left of the text. Then of course we can also go about translating them, and that's when we find out that what we have here is essentially a long list of the advancing group of Achaean soldiers from Book 2. A big part of what we just did involves comparing what we see in the papyrus to the canonical Greek lines of the Iliad. But of course, this raises the question, where did the canonical version of the Iliad even come from? The Iliad was extremely popular. Nearly 20% of all preserved literary papyri from Egypt are Homeric, and Homer was durable. In the Middle Ages, Homer continued to be the best known and most studied of the ancient Greek poets. Very early on, we have papyri that are, uh, belong to what is known as the eccentric class of Ptolemaic papyri. Weird title for something that's not so complicated. In short, it means that these papyri predate the establishment of the canonical accepted text of the Iliad, and therefore contain what is known as corruptions and extra elements that were eventually eliminated by the Hellenistic scholars working on the Library of Alexandria in the 2nd century BC. More on that later. These impurities are mostly things like additional lines, omission of lines, and variants that are not preserved in the canon text or in other scholarly editions. The papyrological record then reveals that there was a transmissional watershed in the 2nd century BC, right around the time of the founding of the Library of Alexandria. The number of variations was drastically cut down and appears to have been a serious undertaking of textual standardization essentially delineating the contours of the text by stabilizing the number and sequence of the verses. Obviously, this transition couldn't happen overnight, but it was incredibly rapid and complete. And after that, the text changed very little. Only words here and there, a letter, an accent marker. From there on out, the text was transmitted to us through the scholarly tradition of the Middle Ages, and again, changed very little since then. The one significant change is medium. We went from scrolls to codices, sometimes in the 4th century AD, though scrolls were still produced well into the 5th. After papyrus ceased to be used, the Iliad and the Odyssey were copied onto parchment codices, like Venetus A, which you see here to my left. Venetus A is the earliest extant complete medieval manuscript of Homer, hand-copied and assembled by one or more Byzantine Greek scribes in the 10th century AD. 
There are nearly 200 Homeric manuscripts that succeeded, and they're remarkable in the relative uniformity of this text. Although they don't vary in radical ways from one another, it's important to understand that the medieval manuscripts of Homer do not descend from a single example, nor is there a medieval sort of Vulgate for the Iliad or the Odyssey. This means that a substantial number of texts survived the transfer from papyrus scrolls to parchment codices, and that there were therefore multiple channels of transmission. The Venetus A and several other deluxe manuscripts survived from the 10th to the 13th century AD are invaluable to us for much more than their texts of the Iliad. These manuscripts contain not only the text of the poem, but also excerpts from the scholarly commentaries of Alexandrian scholars, which are copied into the margins and between lines of text. These writings contain notes on the text that explain points of grammar and usage, meaning of words, interpretation, and disputes about the authenticity of the verses and the correct text. The material contained in these marginal notes derives from scholarly works that predate the manuscript's construction by a thousand years or more, and we'll talk about precisely those notes in just a little bit. Filtered through the medieval copies, we then get our own annotated and edited works from the scholarly tradition of the Enlightenment, including this heavily annotated manuscript known as the Burney Manuscript or the Townley Homer, um, named after one of its early owners. That's the one here on the bottom left. The Greek text of the poem is just the text in the middle, and everything surrounding it is marginalia. So why do we even have this tradition? The Iliad was part of the canon of education for any scribe learning Greek in the bilingual education system of greco roman Egypt. We know this not only because of the sheer amounts of fragments that we have of the Iliad from Egypt, but also because of adjacent sources, like this letter that a concerned mother writes to her son, ensuring that he's continuing in his reading, and presumably also copying, of Book 6 during his scribal education. She writes, I took care to send about your health and learn what you are reading. He, she's referring to his tutor, said that it was the sixth book and testified at length concerning your progress. So he's reading the sixth book, and he's also copying it. Why am I so sure he's copying it? A major part of the scribal education was not just reading the text, but also quite literally copying it out, either from the teacher's hand copy or from the teacher's dictation. This is just practice for a career of writing out texts, either from a copy or from dictation. Here you can see a student's workbook dating to the second century BC. This actually belongs to two students, one on the left and one on the right. Papyrus was expensive, and it was shared for school exercise. It was also washed and reused, as this text likely was. This picture is pretty poor quality, but on the real thing, you can see traces of the older ink that was washed off to allow this text to be reused. On the left, our first student has copied out a section of the Iliad, Book 10, lines 305 to 306, along with three unidentified lines in meter. On the right, our student has written out a chorus from an Aeschylus play, and at the bottom, his name, Maron. This hand is obviously not as well practiced as the one we know from our fragment, but he's working on it. When you didn't want to waste precious papyrus, but still wanted to work on your Iliad, there were other options. This text is an example of a wooden tablet, painted white, with ruled lines to teach the student how to write fluidly. The student has been tasked to write portions of Book 4, lines 364 to 373, and include its marginalia on the right. Now, his marginalia is a little bit unusual in that it includes the usual glossary of terms, but it also includes a justification of a copying mistake that he made when he wrote the text. To help students learn, Teachers actually wrote out bits of the Iliad with word separations, a very unusual practice in this time period. This wooden tablet evidences a teacher's practice handwriting with a distinctive line at the beginning of each word to show the student exactly where the words begin and end so that they can practice it on their own. And as today with any learning, repetition was key. Here, a student has repeated line 244 of book 2 19 times over, with some unsurprising sloppiness towards the end of the line and the bottom few lines as well. This squiggly line that you see to the right is not a problem with the parchment, it's something that the student has drawn themselves. So not only is practicing the Iliad uh, 
how common practice, but also doodling in the margins. Of course, the Iliad wasn't the only text that was read and dictated in school. According to Plato, as soon as students were able to understand the written word in addition to the spoken, they were provided with works of good poets to read as they sat in class. They found, he says, in these verses, admonitions, descriptions, and praises and eulogies of good men of the past. But despite all this, Homer was the educator par excellence. Interestingly, not all Homer was equal. Of the statistic I cited above, the Iliad was far more popular than the Odyssey. Over 80% of the Homeric passages evidenced in school were actually from the Iliad, not the Odyssey. And even in that, uh, among the Iliad, books one and two were by far the most common and the most popular. Book one introduces all of the characters and the plot points, so that makes sense, but book two just seems to be a natural continuation. The Iliad was not just for copying. Higher level students and scholars of all calibers were actively engaged in exploring the grammar and content of Homer, and specifically the Iliad, in a scholarly tradition known as scolia minora. Homeric commentaries usually consisted of a text divided into glossaries, a kind of translation of a single Homeric word or perhaps expressions. These were common in schools, and they were also found written quickly in professional handwriting on the back of private copies, or even inscribed in formal capitals on professionally produced books. Some are short, comprising more of what we'd call a glossary, but some are unusually detailed, such as the notes in this British Library papyrus, which offer a discussion of Hector's representation at the end of the poem, and also a morphological explanation of some of the grammar. This leads us to the broader scholarly tradition of examining written work that reached its height in Alexandria, and more specifically in the Library of Alexandria. The library was part of a large research complex in the metropolitan city of Alexandria. The complex, called the Museon, was dedicated to the muses of art and the pursuit of knowledge. The library itself was built under Ptolemy II, who pursued a policy of collecting every literary text he could get his royal hands on and requiring those texts to be copied out and kept at the library. At its height, the library is estimated to have contained around 50,000 sc scrolls, though the number could be higher. Over time, the library declined, and eventually it actually burned down, uh, although it's unclear to what extent, because in 20 BC, the geographer Strabo mentioned that he visited the library, or at least whatever was left of it, so there was clearly something left to visit. Homer, of course, took center stage at the library. One of the most famous librarians was Xenotetus, the first librarian and the tutor of the royal children who lived around 280 BC. He was widely known for his reputation as a Homeric scholar. Although none of his own glosses or descriptions have survived, he's often quoted, and even in sources that are far too late to be his, uh, there are attributions to him, so prestigious was his reputation. Xenotetus wasn't the first Homeric scholar, um, or actually the first librarian of Alexandria who ended up being a Homeric scholar. He was followed by Aristophanes of Byzantium, also the head of the library, and Aristarchus of Samothrace, who both produced second century versions of the text of the Iliad. The Iliad was but part of this robust scholarly tradition of glossing, explaining, and describing what was happening in literary texts for school children and advanced scholars alike. Epic poetry, including the Iliad, was part of what was known as the Epic Cycle a collection of Greek poetry in dactylic hexameter which related the story of the Trojan War. Obviously, the cycle included the Iliad and the Odyssey, but also other works like the Cypria, the Aethiopis, the Little Iliad, the Elopersis, the Nostoi, and the Telogony. With all of those, the Iliad and the Odyssey were considered the crowning glory of the cycle. It was, in effect, a reading list uh, comprising at least the Trojan epics and perhaps even a wider collection. The poems were meant to be treated as a corpus, which could be read in sequence to yield a more or less continuous story. Many of these were composed likely far after the Iliad was already a classic, like Cypria, which tells the origin of the Trojan War and all that happened from then to the point where the Iliad begins. The language of the fragments shows signs of lateness, and the poem can hardly be later than the second half of the 6th century. 
we really possess only meager fragments of the poems involved, and our knowledge of what poems were involved is itself incomplete. But back then, to be a learned scholar in Greco-Roman Egypt meant knowing the epic cycle inside out and backwards, including all of the Scolia Minora and all of the works beyond just the Odyssey and the Iliad. Part of this was also questioning who wrote each one. Even Herodotus, as early as the 5th century BC, considered the Homeric authorship of the Trojan works. But now back to the fragment that started all this. We have so many Greek fragments of the Iliad from Egypt, estimates range from 1,000 to 3,500, that no one has ever collected them all in one place, as it would be a monumental task. The natures of these copies of the Iliad are, as I said, pretty varied. There are ordinary commercial copies, careful copies, and extremely careless ones, copies with sigla and notations, copies with variant readings, and copies with annotations and marginalia. It's hard to classify our own fragment as any one of these categories. On the one hand, it's a neat and accurate copy of the lines with a nice wide margin at the top and bottom. But on the other, there are corrections such as a teacher would make. Take this example, in which the epsilon has been replaced with the correct omicron, or when the diacritics have been added to make reading easier. The question remains as to whether people kept copies of their own for their own amusement or enjoyment. The answer is that we don't quite know. Our best preserved copies, the literary editions, not the schoolboy ones, seem to be intended for scholarly reasons rather than pure unadulterated enjoyment. This is not meant to suggest that uh, nobody enjoyed the Iliad, but rather that the Iliad was much more of a performance art. If you wanted to enjoy the story, you went and listened. If you wanted to offer commentary or become a scholar, you read. Even recently, you could still see the Iliad as it was meant to be performed, orally. In 2015, the Iliad was performed in full at the British Museum, taking a whopping 16 hours to read out loud with actors swapping out for the different books. This concludes today's lecture. This is not all there is to say about the Iliad in Egypt, and if you're interested, here are some books to check out. But this is also most certainly not all there is to say about ancient literature. I urge you to stay tuned for our exciting upcoming lectures in this workshop series, Egyptian love poetry, Hadrian's autobiography, A Thousand Arabian Nights, and even the Book of the Dead. Thank you. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.